Hi, welcome to the first Econ 302 Summer Term 2021 lecture. In this lecture, I will make a review of competitive markets. Those are concepts that you've seen in Econ 201, maybe even in Econ 103. I will make a brief review of what those concepts are and show a couple of definitions that will help us um, tackle the rest of the lectures. In this lecture, I will talk about a general um, market. I will go um, through the demand and the associated consumer surplus. I will go through the supply and the producer surplus. Finally, I will look at the equilibrium on a um, market and I will characterize the properties of the equilibrium, what, um, what the equilibrium relies upon, what those conditions are, and that will lead me to announce pretty much the um, outline for the rest of the course. If you remember your Econ 201 knowledge, the individual function, the individual demand function, was the function you obtain after maximizing a consumer's utility um, subject to a budget constraint and some prices. So prices are uh, given. Imagine you're going to Tim Hortons or Starbucks to buy a coffee. The price is what it is. You have a certain amount of money in your pocket. What um, are you going to order? How many teas? What size of a tea? Donuts, muffins, and so on. Such that it maximizes your utility and it stays within your budget. So the individual demand curve represents the quantity a consumer is willing to purchase for a given unit price. In fact, I should maybe say the optimal quantity in the sense that this is the quantity that maximizes the consumer's utility. So it's Q as a function of P, the quantity as a function of the price, the price is given. The aggregate demand curve is the sum of all these individual demands. So it's going to represent big Q, an aggregate quantity, as a function of the unit price of the good P. The inverse function is what we are going to be working with um, most of the time this semester. It represents the inverse relationship. Instead of having Q equals an expression that contains P, rather, it is P equals an expression that contains Q. We are going to use the inverse demand function mostly in this course because this is the one we use in graphs and this is the one we are going to use when doing calculus as well. Note that the inverse demand represents the price consumers are willing to pay for the qth unit of the good or the qth plus one if you like. Remember that consumers are not willing to pay the same price for the first unit of the good versus the tenth unit of the good. This is due to the law of diminishing marginal utility. Everybody is willing to pay a higher price for the first coffee versus the tenth. In fact, I'm willing to pay $3 for a tea, for the first tea, but I'm willing to pay $0 for the tenth tea of the day because I don't drink that much tea. With the individual demand function comes the notion of consumer surplus. The consumer surplus is the difference between the price a consumer is willing to pay for the good and the price she actually pays. So it measures utility net of the price paid. Imagine a consumer gets the good for free. All the area under the demand curve will represent his utility. Since he has to pay for the good, you remove the price paid from that area and you obtain the consumer surplus. On a graph, this is what it looks like. Here, I'm imagining I'm um, making a model where we are looking at the allocation of um, hockey tickets for a Canucks game. Dollars, the price, are represented on the y-axis and the quantity on the x-axis, which is how it's going to be from now on in this course. The demand function is an aggregate inverse demand function. For instance, this number 100 here represents the willingness to pay 
of consumers for not for the zeroth unit of the good, but for the first unit of the good. So when you are at zero, the demand function tells you the amount consumers are willing to pay for one extra unit. So for the first unit. Consumers are willing to pay $100 for the first ticket. For the second ticket, just align it with one, consumers are willing to pay $80 due to the, to the law of marginal diminishing marginal utility, and so on and so forth. Because 1.5 tickets cannot be sold, or 1.8 tickets or 2.7 cannot be sold, the demand function here looks stepwise. It looks like a stair function. If the good is perfectly divisible, think about, for instance, buying sugar that you can um, measure up to a gram or, or um, a tenth of a gram or so, and so on. The demand function is going to look like a straight line or a curved line, but there won't be any kinks. Imagine the price is P star. That's just what the price of a ticket is. Well, Overall, five units, five tickets are going to be purchased by consumers. But consumers are willing to pay $100 for the first ticket. So they have a consumer surplus equal to 100 minus $45. Here, the P star seems to be equal to $45. The pure utility from consuming the good would go all the way down to zero. The utility from the first unit would be equal to 100. But since there is a price of $45 which is being paid, this will uh, be subtracted from the utility. The remaining part is going to be the consumer surplus. On the second ticket, consumers are willing to pay $80 and they pay $45. So they have a consumer surplus equal to $35. On the third unit, here, they are still willing to pay $80. So they make a consumer surplus of $35 on that unit, and so on and so forth. Why don't they buy more than five units? Because if you look at five here, the demand at five units represents the willingness to pay for the sixth unit of the good. So you can see that Consumers are willing to pay $20 for a sixth ticket, but the price is equal to $45. So this would represent a loss in utility. So they stick to five tickets, which they are willing to pay, um, they are willing to pay the last ticket for $50. Adding up all the surpluses for each unit, and you get this blue area. Let's now go to the second part of the market, the supply function. The supply function represents the quantity Q producers are willing to sell at a given price P. Whether they have market power or not, whether they get to decide P or not, in general, the supply function is going to describe how many units they are willing to produce and sell at this price P. Equivalently, the inverse supply function represents the price they are willing to sell the qth or q plus one unit of the good. The producer surplus is then defined as the difference between the price producers sell the good at and the price they are willing to sell the good at. Remember that the supply function is a result of profit maximization. So if they are willing to sell a unit of a good for $10, it is the price that maximizes their profit. So the difference between the price they actually sell the good at and the price they were willing to sell the good at will be the producer surplus. It actually measures profits plus fixed costs. So if a firm doesn't have any fixed costs, producer surplus and profits are exactly the same things. It's a nice shortcut to make sure that in an exam, for instance, 
your computation of co producer surplus coincides with your result for the profits. On a graph, it's going to look like this. In general, it is upward sloping because remember that the supply function represents the marginal cost of firms. In general, the higher the quantity to produce, the higher the associated costs. And so automatically, the higher the price firms are willing to sell their good for. Their good for. Note that here, at 0 and 1, firms are willing to sell a Canux ticket for $0, probably because it doesn't cost anything to make it. Once we are at 2, producers are willing to sell a third unit, a third ticket for $30, then the fourth for $40, and then the fifth for uh, and then the fifth for $40 as well here. For the sixth ticket, they are willing to sell at $70. So if the price is P star, the producer surplus will be 45, which seems to be P star here, minus zero for the first unit, minus zero for the second ticket, minus 30 for the third ticket, minus 40 for the fourth ticket, and minus 40 for the fifth ticket. Adding this, um, those surpluses together and you get the overall producer surplus. Now that we have characterized supply and demand, let's see what happens when they meet. We call this the competitive equilibrium. Here we assume that we are in perfect competition. In a competitive equilibrium, demand equals supply. So where demand and supply cross will indicate the equilibrium price here, P star. Note that those two functions cross on more than one point. In fact, they cross anywhere between 50 and 40. So in fact, the equilibrium price doesn't have to be 45, it could also be 43 or 47. Any value between 50 and 40 will make supply equal to demand. At one of these prices, firms are willing to sell five units. Consumers are willing to purchase five units as well. So all the units that producers are willing to sell are being purchased by consumers. Note that for the sixth unit, if you look at the demand at five here, consumers are willing to pay $20, whereas producers are willing to sell the sixth ticket for $70. Trade cannot happen here because consumers are not willing to pay $70 and firms are not willing to decrease their price all the way to $20. So they stop at five tickets. The sum of the consumer surplus and the producer surplus is what we call the total surplus. If there was a tax on this graph with a government revenue, then we would have to add the government revenue to the surpluses to get the total surplus. Okay, fairly simple concept so far. Why do we go through them again and again? The reason is because we can use equilibrium to predict outcomes. When P is equal to P star, no one wishes to change their behavior. If the price is too high, there's going to be a surplus. So there's going to be a um, higher supply than demand. Because there's a higher supply, then it will put a downward pressure on prices because many firms offer tickets, but there are only so many consumers to buy them. So if firms want to sell their tickets, they will have to lower their prices. If P is lower than P star, this is the opposite. There is a shortage. There is a um, lower supply than demand. When the price is low, many consumers are willing to purchase, but not many firms are willing to sell. Since there is a shortage, higher demand than supply, 
there will be an upward pressure on prices. Firms will have some bargaining power. They have so many consumers lining up at the store for them, they can allow themselves to increase prices a bit. The competitive equilibrium allocation is Pareto optimal, or Pareto efficient, or just efficient. Total surplus is maximized, the sum of the consumer and the producer surplus. So, it gets me to the definition of a Pareto optimal allocation. An allocation is Pareto optimal if there is no other allocation, goods, services, money, time, any other resources, that will make somebody better off without making somebody else worse off. Imagine a simple situation. They are $5 on the floor and I find them. I happen to be the one finding them. Since I am in Vancouver, chances are it's going to rain tonight and the rain is going to take the money away. So either I leave the money where it is and nobody gets it or I take the money for me, for myself. Two possible allocations. What is going to happen here? Well, the allocation where I leave the money on the floor is not Pareto efficient. Why? Because we can improve upon this allocation. If I get the money for myself, my utility is going to increase. However, nobody else will be affected. So, the allocation where I take the money will make me better off and will make nobody else worse off. So, the allocation where the money is on the floor is not Pareto efficient. Once I have the money, any other allocation would mean that I am losing this money or some of it. Maybe I have to give it to somebody. If I am stripped from some of that money, I will be made worse off. So the allocation where I keep the money for myself is Pareto efficient because any other allocation would make me worse off, at least. Note that Pareto efficiency has a lot to do with the notion of waste. Because if I leave $5 on the floor and nobody can get them, that sounds a lot like a waste, doesn't it? However, allocations could be efficient, but they don't have to be fair. A world with a dictator that owns everything and everybody else owns nothing is technically Pareto efficient, because if you want to make anybody better off, you need to take some resources from the dictator, and that will make the dictator worse off. Of course, probably it will make the, the dictator not that worse off to give away a bit of food, whereas it would increase everybody's utility a lot. Yet, it would make the dictator worse off, and that's enough to say that the allocation is Pareto efficient. So you can see where the government can step in and say, hey, we can find many Pareto efficient allocations, but we want to go to one that is fair. So the government can take money from the rich, redistribute to the poor. That of course will make rich people worse off on the moment, but in this case, we would be going from one Pareto efficient allocation where the rich have most of the money to another Pareto efficient allocation where the income distribution is more balanced. Going from one to the other is going to be painful for somebody, but both are Pareto efficient. Now, it is up to a government or maybe to yourself to decide which allocation is better. The first welfare theorem is one of the most fundamental results in economics. It says that under certain conditions, every competitive equilibrium allocation is Pareto optimal or efficient, which is why we study perfect competition so much. It gives us a benchmark on what's efficient. It is not very realistic, but then we can start violating the conditions for perfect competition and look at the impact on the equilibrium. 
what are these conditions? Periphery competition is a condition. It is composed of five features, which I'm going to explain in the next slide. No externalities. They cannot be any external effects to market transactions that are going to affect bystanders who never uh, took part in the transaction. And finally, no public goods. No goods which are non-rival and non-excludable. I will go over this as well. Perfect competition first. It's made of five features. First one, market participants take prices are given. They have no market power. You could imagine, for instance, that the market is so big that producers and consumers are too small to influence the market. Even producers take the price as given. It's like a stock price. So they have no market power. Market participants have perfect information. If they want to know something about the product, they can know about it right away without any cost and in a very accurate way. There won't, there won't be anything such as misinformation. This is a way to make sure that firms cannot exploit those windows where only some people know about the good, but not others. The third condition is that there are no barriers to entry or exit to the market. If a firm sees that there are profit prospects in an industry, a firm can just integrate that industry and start making profits. If, on the other hand, it starts making losses, it can easily exit the market and move on to another industry. The idea behind this condition is that if there is a market where profits are positive, firms will enter the market, compete, which will drive prices down until eventually in the long run, profits will be equal to zero. Careful. Saying that profits are equal to zero is not a bad thing here in economics. The way we define profits is revenue minus costs. And we are talking about any type of cost. So if your profit is equal to zero, it means that you made enough money to pay everybody, yourself as a CEO included. You pay the employees, you paid the bank if you borrowed money, you paid for all the intermediary products, all the um, raw, um, all the raw products, the manufacturing, and so on. You paid for capital, and so on. If you make a positive profit, it's extra money on top of paying every everybody and and everything. Fourth condition, the good is homogeneous. So it is the same, exact same across producers. The reason behind this condition is that we need products to be exactly the same so that the price is the only thing that will make consumers buy one good over another. If products are heterogeneous, you're going to get into a case where each firm has a captive demand. Each firm is going to sell, even if they sell at a higher price, because there might be somebody who's willing to pay more for Pepsi-Cola than for Coca-Cola, for instance. Products are very similar, but they are not the same. And finally, the fifth condition is that production inputs are perfectly mobile. The idea is that if a firm needs to adjust its quantities, it can do so by adjusting all the inputs the way it wants. If inputs are not perfectly mobile, then firms might be stuck with a certain amount of inputs that they have to pay for and deal with, which is going to have impacts on um, the competition in the industry. Each of these conditions in real life fails one way or another. Most markets don't, um, most markets don't satisfy the first condition. Most markets have um, an oligopolistic structure where only a couple of firms, big firms, are on the market. So they have market power. They propose a good which is not homogeneous in general. Pepsi-Cola is close to Coca-Cola, but it's not Coca-Cola. Not the same color, not the same component. Even the shape of the bottle is different. 
Perfect information now is close to being satisfied, especially in the information age, where we can just click on, um, just do a search on, inter on the internet and see the price of a good at Safeway versus the price of a good at SaveOn, or any other thing. Production inputs are relatively mobile, although this is not perfect. If you think about firms in a remote area, they will have a limited access to workers and maybe as well to capital that they might need to ship. Many industries feature bar barriers to entry as well. In particular, industries that require a huge investment in some equipment. It is, in this case, very difficult for a firm to enter the market because of the cost of this equipment when a well-established firm already in the industry can adopt a predatory behavior and propose lower prices to make sure the entrant is going to make a loss. And this barriers to entry and exit are going to threat um, how competitive an industry can get. I mentioned as well that there shouldn't be any externalities. I will go over this in three weeks. Externalities are choices of market participants that have an effect on bystanders, on, on uh, agents who did not take part in the transaction in the first place. So here, we need no externalities. So choices of market participants have no direct effect on the others that the market cannot account for. If there is an effect on somebody else, at least the market is either making them pay or compensating them one way or another. Finally, I mentioned that there shouldn't be any public goods. Public goods are goods which are non-rival and non-excludable. Adding one more consumer does not, um, does not reduce the availability of the good to others. That's non-rivalry. And non-excludability refers to the fact that it, it is not possible to exclude somebody from the consumption of the good. So, in this course, we are going to cover a bunch of things. In particular, we are going to violate perfect competition assumptions one by one and see how they are going to affect the um, market equilibrium outcomes. So, we are going to go over imperfect competition. We are going to give market power to firms in the next lecture about monopoly. We are going to change the information structure and imagine that one side of the market has information that the other side of the market doesn't have. This is going to threaten um, trade and it's going to lead to an inefficient outcome. We are going to talk about externalities and public goods, how they lead to a market failure and how this can be solved. We will need a new theory about how people behave strategically and in small numbers. So this is also why we are going to go through game theory. In fact, we are pretty much going to spend half of the semester on game theory concepts. Several ideas of the ones we are going to um, study in this course have led to Nobel Prizes in economics. In 1991, Rural Coase got a Nobel Prize for his work on um, bargaining and asymmetric information. Harsani, Nash and Selton got a Nobel Prize for their contribution in um, game theory. Mirlas and Vikri also have a huge contribution in game theory, in particular in auctions. Akerlof, Spence, and Stiglitz got the Nobel Prize for their work in asymmetric information. In fact, we'll study Akerlof and Spence's models once the time comes. Oman and Schelling, I believe, are um, game theorists, so they made a big contribution in the field of game theory. Mashkin, Meyerson, and Hurwitz are also uh, big contributors to the industrial um, organization literature, competition between firms, industries, and um, different information structures. 
Jean Tirole, 2014, a French guy, finally, who got the Nobel Prize. He is um, teaching and is also the president of the um, university in Toulouse. Toulouse is a city in France. This is where I studied, where I did my uh, master's program. He has a huge contribution in industrial organization in general, and he has a very, very um, famous, actually he has two very famous textbooks, one about game theory and one about industrial organization. In 2016, Hart and Holstrom also got the Nobel Prize for their work in asymmetric information and, um, and auctions. That's it for this um, brief review of competitive markets. I just wanted to throw a couple of definitions out there. Make sure that we all are on the same page regarding those definitions. You will need to know them by heart for any tests or quizzes. I might just ask you what the definitions are. And you will definitely need them to tackle the next three or four lectures. I'll see you in the, lecture, in the next lecture about monopoly and price discrimination. In the meantime, stay safe and uh, see you in the next one. Bye.